This bad behavior is new. Now you're interested. I've seen everything. You have my ticket stubs. Damn it, what is with you people? I don't know a damn thing. Please don't raise your voice. Okay, so it's me. I left my lunch pail on the bus, and I'm having a baby. You see what happens to people who speak up? No one will move forward without your approval. You should be taking meetings like this twice a week. If you want to woo me, you'll have to buy me my own lunch. I look at you and I think, I want what he has. What if this is my time? Welcome to Mad Men Men, the weekly show where we discuss a show that used to come out weekly. Each week, we take a close look at an episode of the AMC series Mad Men, which ran from 2007 to 2015. And we are changing the conversation of the show all these years later, where one of us is a first-time watcher of the show. Another one of us went through it one time back when it was airing. And then there's me who watches it about once a year. I'm John Agroni, and I don't believe podcasters belong in graveyards. And next, of course, we have Will Ashton, and, and good, because Will, we need to talk about how much money you're spending on microphones, lapel mics, and okay, now he's walking out of the room. Yeah, no, I mean, I understand that. I, I feel that in my <laughs> I always feel like I'm the one with mic issues, even today, like I can't even get my computer working again, so. Yeah, Will's, Will's been recording from his phone uh, the last few weeks, so uh, Cinemaholics and Mad Men Men have been uh, a little bit more underground, a little bit more sure. where, we're, where right. we're meeting up. We're yeah. already in the '90s of uh, the podcast, and the so yeah, we're already going forward and behind at the same time. Mike is out sick. What I was gonna say, I had a whole thing prepared for him. I was gonna say over here we have Mike Overholz, who was just telling me a moment ago that it is possible Negronis are out podcasting people two to one. Um, that was that was definitely an edgier one. So maybe it's better that he wasn't here for that. Um, and uh, we have a special guest. Um, his name is Ben Crew, and when we asked Ben Crew to be our guest, his exact words were, "Damn it, what is with this podcast? I don't know a damn thing." <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even finish it. Uh, hey, Ben, welcome to Mad Men Men. How's it going? Going great. I'm so glad to be here talking about my favorite show. Yeah, your favorite show is an understatement. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so Will, walk us through. I think you'll you'll explain better than me who who Ben is and uh, what he means to this podcast. I'll say he's a writer. Uh, who has grown notable in the Mad Men fan community uh, for his posts and monthly Mad Men trivia nights he hosts in Chicago. Uh, But there's an even deeper backstory to this guy. What's going on? So I forget when, but sometime after we started the podcast uh, in season one, I decided to do a running bit where I'm just going to send you every single tweet about Mad Men that comes up on my timeline. Just, you know, constant stream. Uh, Cause you usually we kind of DM like random, like Twitter, like things that like we find funny or just random notable things or like news stories or whatnot. But I decided to make it a bit where it's like any Mad Men tweet that comes to my timeline is going to do it. And I thought initially when it started doing that, um, that it would only be like, maybe like, you know, like a few, a handful uh, of tweets. But then I, I found out either because I kept like copy and pasting them to you or just the algorithm to the show that like, I get like, almost like three to five tweets about uh, Mad Men Daily on my timeline. And I feel like four of those five usually end up being Ben's. <laughs> and I, so, and I'm going to, con- let me explain. I'm in a constant state of panic that Will is going to get spoiled on more and more things because he keeps seeing these tweets, but he does not, you will not let this bit die. No, it's important. And I won't stop <laughs> until the very last episode of this podcast is out. And maybe I'll keep it going if I feel like it, but that's my goal. Well, and uh, yeah, so so Ben, uh, I I have seen so many of your tweets. Um, I always get a real kick out of them. Hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, you post a lot about Mad Men stuff. Yeah, I do, and it really only started a year ago. I actually hadn't finished a show until a year ago, which really surprises people. Really, um, I I had a relationship where towards the end of it, she was a huge Mad Men fan, and uh, we just started watching the show. She was on a rewatch. And we decided to end our relationship. She said, but you should keep watching. And I said, yeah, it is a good show. And I just kept watching it from there. And it's just very funny uh, that that was like what kind of spiraled me into it um, was last summer was really when I was just obsessively watching it. And that was as a result, uh, I was like, well, what if this is my whole personality? And I started posting. I think the first real big post I did was one where I said, hey, come in a movie and I'll have Don Draper pitch that movie. And this is me like watching, I think I was like three seasons in at that point. And that really took off. And I realized that people really love this show. And I think I'm 
good at inhabiting the character of Don Draper's voice. So I just kept <laughs> Roger. going from there. Absolutely. You definitely um, got Roger nailed down. And it just progressively became more insane bits. There's uh, my favorite one was like Don Draper in the nineties. And it's like, uh, I don't think this is a spoiler, but Don Draper looks at a Coke machine in one scene. I replaced it. So it was like the Pokemon snap machine that was in blockbusters in the late nineties. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, the stupidest goofy bits. But I think that Breaking Bad is this kind of like meme community that loads of people contribute to. And I kind of thought in my head, I was like, well, you could probably do that for Mad Men. And I started doing it. And as a result, you've seen progressively more insane and almost surreal Mad Men memes pop up as a result. Uh, so it's just funny seeing how things can kind of spiral or grow. I mean, that's what I mentioned with being a Mad Men fan. I do those trivia nights in Chicago. Um, I just thought like, oh, hey, you know, this would be a lot of fun. Maybe a few people will be game for it. We just had our most recent one Thursday and there was like 45 people there and it was uh, enough old fashions for 100 people. Uh, it was just a really wonderful event, but I never expected that that would take off like that. And it was really just so wonderful seeing so many other fans that care about the show as much as you do and enjoy making those references and, of course, dressing up, doing the trivia, watching an episode, the whole nine yards. I mean, the love people have for Mad Men, it continues to surprise me. I mean, Will and I have been doing Cinemaholics, a movie review podcast, since 2017. It's in its sixth year. And legitimately, our Mad Men episodes, which we just started last year, do almost more downloads than that- a Cinemaholics episode. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't tell you. <laughs> well, I sometimes think- I look at the downloads and I can't believe it. If I'm oh. going to analyze it, I think that Mad Men's like one of the most rewatchable shows it like, really is, ever made. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of movies that are my favorite movies that I'm not always in the mood to go rewatch. I will always be in the mood to put on Mad Men in the background. There's never going to be a time where, like, I'm not feeling that today. Um, It just has the way, you know, you fall in love with these characters who are terrible people and live through their lives. um, You could just jump back into it at any moment. And it's always it's almost comfortable. It's very strange saying the, the alcohol sex addict, you know, show is very comfortable, but it is comfort watch very cozy mm-hmm. um now, we are uh, before we jump ahead, in, i do have one question which is you're talking about like how mad men was like it, there's untapped potential there with memeage and turning into like having the same kind of fanfare as breaking bad so what do you think is another show or the next show that should have that because i have an answer but i don't know if you'll agree um this is i, I sort of want to draw this in because i just had a thread about it the other day but uh detroiters oh, okay. um which is funny because it's like mentally ill Midwestern madmen, um, but it's it's you know obviously you know the I think you should leave team right. uh, Tim Robinson, um, and it is about admin in Detroit, Michigan, uh, who have their Don Draper Roger Sterling moments. But I was like, I just had an episode on the back the other day where one of the characters is like to our uh, wives and girlfriends, may they never meet, and then Tim Robinson's like, no. I love my wife. Why would you say that? It's like the exact opposite of Batman. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> but it, I tell people, you know, who are like craving, you know, something similar to Madman, like it isn't similar to Madman, but it is as a funny, like dessert to watch. Almost is <laughs> something that is in the same vein of, Hey, you get to watch two idiots pitch something. Um, but it's, you know, obviously, uh, much more comedic. Not that Madman is a funny show. Season six is one of the funniest seasons of TV ever. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I haven't watched the Troyers yet. I should. It's on my list, especially after I think you should leave. But I feel like from the very little bits I've seen, it seems like it's like Mad Men on bath salts. It is. Yeah. And that's <laughs> absolutely why I wanted to get way more attention. Uh, the Troyers is just a wonderful show. And I love shows that kind of serve as a love letter to where they take place. And, of course, the Troyers is very much that. Well, didn't you just send me a, a clip from the Troyers? Or was that somebody else? It might have been one of Ben's tweets. It, it might have been me. Oh, the one because the one where they're like the drinking one, right? Yeah, that was yeah, I okay. that. That was I said very Roger Sterling, Don Draper coded, and it was them. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say. I was like, <laughs> I feel like Will. You're, yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, I just took that as uh, you. Uh, you would watch the show, but um, all right. Well, today we're gonna talk about the fog. Um, season three. And of course, you know, Will already sent me a message in a panic um, on the slide. Like, John, you didn't do your podcast puns yet uh, or enough of them. So don't worry, Will. You you know, you could have just said it out loud, but uh, it's okay. I read your messages faithfully and fruitfully. Um, So I do have, I do have a few. Uh, The first one, let's get the bad one out of the way. You have little veins, breathe and think about the beauty podcast. Um, I tried. It wasn't, it wasn't working. Um, This one is just more of like an emotional, you know, I don't want another podcast. I want my podcast. A good one, right? 
I left my lunch pail on the bus and I'm having a podcast. We've got bigger problems to worry about than podcasts. That's a political one. You don't listen to Mad Men, men? I don't believe you. And uh, th- this one's a little bit more of a thinker. Okay. Just yesterday I was on Spotify and I thought every single one of these animals, the mother had them. They were a guest. And I think there they are on the other side of the stream. And you know what? Every single one of them blamed their podcast host. I don't know how, but I know this is somehow therapeutic for you and it helps like kind of chase some demons that you have. Hmm. So I'm glad that this is better. <laughs> Will, Will, you're supposed to respond. That's a bullshit podcast. Yeah, there you go. That's, yeah, that's usually... Dude, sure. Don't worry. I only have four more. If anything ever happened to this podcast, I don't know what I do. And there'd be that new guest host. How could I listen to that new guest host? Uh, this is a good one. You're a podcast host. You're very important. And you you have little to do. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever told you that half the time this podcast comes down to I don't like that guy. And that's true. Um, and then the last one, this is the best one. Uh, I'm a stranger in a strange podcast, but I can tell you that there's definitely Ben Crew going on. Very nice. Ending, ending strong. <laughs> um, okay. So, well, now that all the bad stuff is out of the way, all the demons as Will mentioned, uh, The Fog, we're on season three, episode five. This was directed by Phil Abraham and written by Cater Gordon. Cater Gordon, we brought it before. Uh, we've already discussed uh, the allegations that she uh, held against uh, Matthew Weiner for sexual harassment. And so I think it was um, the same year that this episode came out. It wasn't long after this. Uh, she won an Emmy um, for her work on the show. Uh, three weeks later, she was fired. Um, so a lot of bad stuff going on there. Uh, but this is her last work on the show. And uh, this is the first episode of season three. Uh, we'll start early with some trivia that Matthew Weiner did not write. Uh, he wrote, which is a little strange. He he writes a lot of uh, episodes, but he was on a bit of a roll between this and uh, not just season three, but he was like, uh, you have to go all the way back to like mid season two. Uh, to find an episode where Matthew Weiner was not writing one of the episodes. But uh, yeah, uh, in terms of ratings, this is where the season started to perk back up a bit. So just a reminder, uh, it started with a series high of 2.76 uh, in terms of millions, dipped down to 1.9, it dipped down more to 1.6, and then it dipped down to 1.51, which is the lowest of season three. But now we're kind of perking back up. Uh, this episode, we've got 1.75, uh, one of the highest uh, ratings of the season and the fog is uh was very highly rated it got very good uh critics uh notices from av club and slants and uh, i think that's because it's a very good episode of mad men but uh what do you two think ben ben what, what what's your impression on this episode watching it re-watching it how does it compare to other episodes in this season for you so uh, I was asked which episode of like season three I'd want to choose, and I thought about it, and this is the one I chose. And the reason I chose it is, to me, it's the most similar in style to the episode of The, Sopr- the, the Sopranos. I think that if you watch yeah. it, it... Oh, has The Talking this, Fish? Uh, yeah, this, it has a very... This is one of the most surreal episodes uh, of uh, Mad Men. And The Sopranos has a lot, a lot of surreal episodes. Um, and it's this one just very much works for me. It's... The episode that makes you feel the most for Betty, a lot of people, you know, even on their umpteen three watch, say like, ah, oh, Betty, I hate her. But you watch this episode and you feel so bad for her um, because, you know, she is a house cat little to do. And that's the saddest thing about her. She just, you know, didn't even want to have this child. Um, she lives in a dream world, as you see, you know, in this episode and the surrealism that how it captures the Medgar Evers stuff really like the first time I saw that visual my mouth was a gape of, uh, you know, Betty's mother with Medgar Evers there was that's to me, one of the strongest visuals on the show that just stays with me. How just heart wrenchingly, you know, this episode tears you apart for Betty's own mind how she escapes into, you know, the own insecurities and kind of the fault that she knows that she has. Um, But there is a lot of heart wrenching stuff in this episode and accomplishes that through the surreal shots, even not with just Betty, the opening where they talk about um, Sally getting in a fight. And it has that kind of surreal shot of Sally smearing the blood over her face. Um, That's a really wonderful shot. And, it establishes that you're going to get something that's a bit of a dreamy episode that doesn't fully have its feet on the ground. And that's why it's going to wreck you. So this is the best episode of season three to me. And it's because it embraces that surreal side of the show that makes it work so well. I can definitely see the case for that. For me, it's tough because the next episode guy walks into an advertising mm. agency 
that's one of my favorite episodes of the series. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, but uh, the fog is also really, really great. And, uh, you know, before we go to you, Will, I'll, I'll just say one of the cool things about this episode too, is that almost all of the major players of Mad Men get a lot of room here, get a lot to do. So big Betty episode, big Pete episode, Don, Lane, Sally. We really like run the gamut, Peggy. Uh, the only major character we don't really see here is Joan. Uh, and we get only a little bit of Roger, but obviously he can move mountains with sentences. Mm. Uh, but, you know, Will, uh, what about you? This is your first time watching The Fog. Are you still in it? Are you still in that fog of deciding what you think? No, I mean, I really thought this was a tremendous episode. And I agree with Ben in the sense that I remember when you were catching up on The Sopranos and you got to season five, which is my favorite season of Sopranos. And I believe that's when Matthew Weiner came on to the show. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of the series is The Test Dream, which involves uh, Tony Soprano kind of through most of the episode in this kind of hazy uh, dream uh, world where like things are, you know, like kind of like dream metaphors, uh, but also like very much like he's able to kind of figure out this big revelation uh, that will affect the end of the season. But uh, I remember when you watch that episode, you're like, oh, OK, I can definitely see like uh, where this would kind of influence Weiner uh, in, in Mad Men, uh, because I think he co-wrote that episode with David Chase. And uh, I wasn't really sure, you know, for like the first two seasons, outside of maybe the California stuff having kind of a dreamy, hazy quality, where that would really factor into the plot. And then we get to this episode, which even like the stuff that's based in reality, as Ben's kind of alluding to, has a sort of uh, dreamlike quality. Like, the, like there's a surrealism to uh don and betty kind of being in the classroom sitting down like acting like almost like don looks very like studious and almost like a kid like uh bobby would be and um yeah just throughout this episode i love how much they're willing to kind of play with style and tone and allow it to kind of still be true to what Mad Men is and the thematic uh resonance of the the show so thus far um but allow it to be bold and brazen and kind of push audiences to see a reflection of the characters that we have seen in like more uh you know literal or maybe kind of more like uh allegorical ways but like just like really kind of be in betty's shoes uh it almost kind of weirdly weirdly reminds me like especially the caterpillar scene of like some stuff from like twin peaks returns because i'm going through twin peaks right now as well uh yeah it's just really uh fascinating stuff and yeah certainly i think it's my favorite of the season thus far yeah, I mean, this is a, an easy episode to love for how dense it is. Uh, I'm curious what you all think this episode is really about, like when you really break it down. Um, you know, I, I was kind of trying to, I was reading uh, Mad Men Carousel, and I know, you know, Matt Zoller Sites kind of pauses that it's about empathy. I certainly picked up on a lot of, you know, th this episode is so much about uh, how the civil rights movement was kind of getting started. And it, there's a lot of comparing and contrasting between the American dream as it relates to uh, white women housewives, uh, but then also, you know, black Americans, like black um, middle class, working class Americans who, you know, uh, for example, Carla only gets mentioned in this episode. And I think it's so telling, right, that you have the Medgar Evers death impacting Sally a young white uh, baby boomer and clear, you know, she's kind of like so curious about that murder, but to her, it's like a curiosity. Whereas to Hollis, you know, it's something that when he gets to the point where he he's in kind of a precarious situation with Pete, he, he kind of brings it up without bringing it up. Um, and then it's implied that Carla, well, you know, isn't in the house and that she would have had to have been forced to stay to help out instead of Francine, because I think the implication is that uh, Carla is upset and doesn't want to basically be thinking of anything else because Megger Evers. So his death um, happens a couple weeks before this episode happens in 1963, June 20th to June 22nd. And Medgar Evers, a civil rights activist, he uh, was part of the NAACP, very instrumental in that. Um, I think uh, it was just like a week or so, or no, it was just a few hours after JFK announced uh, on national television uh, that the Civil Rights Act uh, was something that they wanted to get done. Uh, Medgar Evers was assassinated, uh, murdered in his own driveway by a white supremacist who never even got convicted uh, until 1994. 
Um, so just give you kind of an inkling of like what was going on uh, with the justice system back then. Um, I know we've talked about Emmett Till uh, on on the podcast before, and a lot of that stuff connects. I think we've talked about Emmett Till. I could be thinking of Cinemaholics because the movie just came out. Yeah, because we were talking about the the movie that came out last year. Okay, yeah, yeah. We might not have actually talked about it on Mad Men, um, since it, it did happen in the 50s. Uh, but yeah, all that said, that's obviously hanging in the background of this episode. So, Ben, do you, how do you think that that all connects? Because I, I think that if there's one thing about Mad Men we can rely on, it's that the writers are always trying to find ways to connect all of these subplots together. The Pete stuff, you know, you see the direct co- uh, links and everything. Um, but there's other stuff in this episode that might not be so uh, readily apparent. Uh, what's your take? I think it kind of serves as a commentary on the show itself in a way because I think if you were to ask the writers of Mad Men today, was there anything you'd do differently? And I don't think this is a spoiler for the entire show, but they'd probably say we didn't give enough voice to many of the African-American characters, um, to the characters of color. I just think that you can look at throughout the seasons, um, there are a lot of stories that kind of start and they don't as much finish. And that's because, you know, they're saying like, well, this is the very white male dominated world that Mad Men takes place in and people are going to shift focus. That's, you know, Pete sees the opportunity um, to sell televisions um, and the um, Admiral television. That's what it is. He says, you know, there is a large um, black market for this. And of course, they say we don't you know, want to sell to them. And it's just kind of this almost acknowledgement of like, hey, you know, this world is focused on white male characters. And even though you want to focus on something else, the characters themselves are fighting against it. So it's like Betty sees her own faults and her own kind of failings when she's having this dream sequence type moments. And the show itself is saying, here's a storyline we could do where, you know, Pete is realizing, you know, we can move the story forward here. We can, you know, do an entire ad campaign focused to a black market. So be very progressive, be very good. And the characters say, no, sorry. So it's sort of, to me, I think the show is almost analyzing its own failing um, or it's saying uh, we're continuing to focus on these white male stories. And this is, you know, something we wish we could change. Um, and of course, they could have changed that. They, there's a lot of other stories they could have done. And it is, it, it's, it's effective, but also sad. I mean, you look at a lot of those stories that start. And, you know, um, again, like you mentioned with Carla, um, Carla's not in this episode and you could have given a scene, uh, where Carla gets to talk about Medgar Evers or has some kind of interaction with Betty, uh, early on. I mean, we're here to infer that stuff. Um, but it's this kind of sad, but still effective element of the show where they know what their own kind of fault or failing is. And the same thing, as I said, with Betty and with Pete's storyline, so this episode to me is about analyzing um, where you fail as a business, as a person. How do you move forward? And of course, there's the uh, um, the cop in the uh, waiting room who is obviously, um, you know, it, it falls into a lot of stereotypes of cops is what I will say. I love how the, yeah, he's a prison warden. And my favorite thing about his character is how badly he wants to talk about his job, mm-hmm. you know, because he's just sort of like, Oh yeah, like the prison can't run without me, and he's like, you know, kind of like bumping his elbow, and then he's just like, ah, oh, the prison, ah, oh, the inmates, and Don's just like, w- would would you get attacked? And he's like, I was wondering when you'd ask me. <laughs> it's like, okay, dude, uh, that's Matt Bouchel, uh, who plays the character. Uh, everybody, had to, everybody got to hear my terrible impression of his accent uh, <laughs> earlier on the show. Um, and uh, yeah, Will, I know you and I were chatting before the episode that we were kind of curious you know if one day that character is going to have to look on the other side of the bars and see a young sally draper um who has uh really fallen down the, the path of crime after yeah. uh, attacking her own classmates uh of course robbing her own grandfather i mean she's on the dark path yeah she was smoking cigarettes and just has been going <laughs> that's her. right um yeah i mean i i feel for sally i mean obviously uh she's in a tough place and uh I hope the best for her, but yeah, she's on uh, thin ice these days. You know, she just every episode seems like she's doing something uh, just you know nefarious, and uh, I don't know. She needs she needs something help of some sort, and I, I, I do. I really love the scene um, with her and uh, Don in the kitchen where they actually get to have a heart heart because- where he feeds her raw meat. <laughs> well, it's like, <laughs> I mean, did you look at it? It's like, you literally see the meat and it's still really red. And then he puts the egg in and then like 10 seconds later, he puts it on her plate. Like she's getting sick. 
I don't know. I, I've had meals like that in my past. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. Um, well, I'll, I'll be sure to call child services. Don uh, grew up in the depression. And he's just happy to have something on the plates. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it's just really, I mean, that's the one thing that she's really been looking for. And I think we talked about that a fair bit, uh, last week, but yeah, I mean, just the fact that she's been yearning for a parental figure, had that with Jean for a couple episodes and then abruptly lost that in such a tragic way. And now kind of only briefly, but meaningfully has that moment with, with Dawn, a man who is so isolated. And then like the, the contrast with that where Don, you know, throughout this whole episode has been there for everybody except for the one person who really needs him, uh, which is Betty, who, you know, is like wailing and calling for him. And obviously, I mean, there's a number of factors there as to why he's not there. Um, But I mean, yeah, it's just a really effective uh, scene with just the two of them there in the kitchen towards the end. Well, we we should uh, just to clear it up. I mean, Don never goes looking for these moments of connection. He he stumbles upon them, right? he, He doesn't really initiate conversation with the prison guard the prison guard initiates with him sally is the one who walks in on him cooking he expects people to come to him the whole thing with peggy is like she comes into his office he doesn't go looking to like create any sort of uh, you know deep meaningful connection with people that's just not who he is but it does show that he's able to basically form a friendship with anybody that is you know it should this episode shows don's great talent that you could you know because him and the prison uh, guy wouldn't normally be friends, is what the impression that I get. So they're not going to just be buddies and get beers. But Don's because not they a are, narc, yeah. Yeah, because they are in a similar situation, um, they find connection over that. And there's even that shot at the end whenever he walks by him and, you know, the guy pays him no mind. Because, you know, they both, there's no more use for the other one, you know, for, you know, for each other to talk. They yeah, both, I mean, it, some people have read it too, of like, there's like guilt there, you know, because he makes that promise to, to Don that he's going to be a better man. And like maybe even just seeing Don reminds him of like, Oh, you know, I, I know I'm not going to actually live up to that promise. Maybe he's already broken it at this point. And so he just kind of, but also there's that like dreamlike quality of the episode where you could even question how much of that really happened. <laughs> you know, did Don, yeah. you know, uh, kind of mix some of this stuff up in his head. Who knows? I will say I should have probably mentioned this earlier, but throughout this episode, because it is my first time seeing it, there was a sense of dread, on my part because i kept like there's so much focus on death and like betty's going through this very intensive uh pregnancy and all this stuff i was really worried that was going to be like a miscarriage or something was going to happen to the kids she literally crushes a caterpillar there's like Mm -hmm. (laughs) definitely like a sort of uh yeah foreshadowing there you think and also like with like you know like as we mentioned like sally had the blood on her face and then later we see gene mopping up the floor with blood and then like um also, we see uh, Betty's mom, who we've never seen before until now. Grandma uh, Ruthie. There she yeah. is. Yeah. Um, wiping uh, blood as well. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, I just kept thinking like, oh, God. And then like when we had that moment where he like, kind of looks down, I was really nervous. I was like, oh, God, did something happen to the kid? Does he know something that Don doesn't know? But then when we cut to the uh, meeting with Pete, I was like, OK, that's, maybe that's just me being paranoid. I don't know what it is but um but yeah i don't know i was really anxious about that i feel like i was maybe more anxious than i was supposed to be outside of you know being in betty's shoes throughout this episode but i don't know it made for a very effective viewing i will admit no i i honestly i was wondering when we first when i first watched this episode i thought she had died when we were like looking at the dream sequence i thought that was her going into the afterlife because it is you know yeah it's so surreal yeah, I mean, she even mentions that to Gene, I think, at one point. It's just like, is this like, you know, like the Great Beyond or something? something yeah, along. yeah. Yeah, he's, he's very obviously coy about that, uh, which kind of reminds me of the, uh, going back to Sopranos, like the Kevin Ferdy stuff in uh, the beginning of season six, uh, without giving too much away there mm. uh, for that show. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, good stuff. But yeah, it made me <laughs> on Pinsley. Yeah. Yeah, I take great joy looking back at fan theories, what people thought was going to happen. I thought about doing a Madman trivia round uh, that was basically fan theories or things that didn't happen that people were kind of, you know, like I can't, this isn't spoilers, but of course there's things in the 60s, you know, like of course the Manson family happens eventually. So people, you know, naturally assume uh, that there will be, (laughs) uh, you know, things that happen later that tie into history is what I will say. Um, So it's interesting seeing, you know, what people thought would happen. When you go back and look at, you know, uh, online forums from like 2012, 
uh, and how you know off the mark a lot of people are. But when you read it, you think like, well, that would have been really good if that had happened. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, and that especially with you know uh, thinking that that might uh, end in a miscarriage, uh, especially. Yeah. And uh, I do really appreciate the way this episode depicts childbirth. Uh, particularly, this is very specific to the 60s when uh, this this is a real thing called uh, the twilight sleep. Um, so there used to be the practice where they would really just like knock the mothers out and kind of just do things without the permission of the husband or the wife. Um, more importantly, the wife. I mean, like the way that she like wakes up and is like thrashing about and they basically are just like, disregarding her was unfortunately very common back then. And it, it was eventually banned in the seventies because it was, you know, it was causing like a lot of suffering, um, from women, uh, from the babies. And so we definitely have more regulations now. There's definitely more oversight on like the types of drugs uh, that can be used and, uh, just like having like a system in place so that sort of thing doesn't get abused. Uh, because yeah, it's, it's haunting to see like Betty, like thrashing about like that and then waking up and then all of a sudden there's like a baby in her arms like very very poetic um but uh kind of in a dark way too so uh but yeah even when she's like her face is all red and the sweat i mean january jones like really delivers in this episode pun actually intended Um, (laughs) and i didn't even mean to at first yeah um yeah i mean and it's also just a really effective metaphor considering that you know, like of these last few episodes in season three, we're starting to see Betty kind of get more of uh, independence, kind of ha- finding herself, you know, more in, you know, direct communication with her husband. But like, you know, there is still that sense of like she doesn't really know what's going on, you know, both with like her marriage and like what's going on around her. And she's like, you know, like emotionally still in this very vulnerable place. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, not only it being very time appropriate, it just feels like a very effective and heartbreaking uh, metaphor for what uh, Betty's been going through throughout this whole show. Now I do got to bring up, Will, I assume you were excited to see the duck is back uh, earlier this season. You were kind of like, where's that guy? Is he coming back? Cause I think you're still waiting for duck to come back because he's uh, how we get Chauncey back. But I, th- I don't yeah. know. I think you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I I was really hoping, uh, you know, once we got to that dinner or sorry lunch date with uh, Pete <laughs> or sorry with Peggy and then Pete, yeah, uh, yeah. I was waiting for the third guest to show up, being of course Charlie sitting down and you know like kind of like talking about the new uh, marketing team they're going to have at the rival company, but uh, you know, K- uh, you know, Chauncey is uh, someone who's just waiting for their time to come back. I, I, I know it. <laughs> They've been pulling the strings behind the scenes. Um, I could have never been on the Madden writers room. Cause I would have been like, what if Chauncey comes back in this episode? Like every single episode. And they'd be like, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> they finally <laughs> just, just kick you out. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what if Doug Phillips gets ripped apart by a pack of stray dogs in this episode? And they're like, and Chauncey's the one that co- made the call. Yeah. <laughs> um, so oh, yeah. I know that. That would have been what what kept me out of the writer's room was I would have been fighting for Chauncey. That's our Sopranos moment. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, John and I were talking about, uh, you know, it would have been great to have Chauncey in the waiting room as well at the hospital. Like, <laughs> you know, like, kind of foul with his that would have, make a campaign for that digitally add Chauncey to the right. end of Mad Men. There you go. Uh, but then you got Smith, who I forgot to mention, you're Link Smith, Lisa Simpson herself in this episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I would have loved if, like Chauncey was there in the waiting room. It's just like it's a baby puppy. It's two. <laughs> it's yeah. three. Well, Hurley yeah. Her- Smith had to be in that role because uh, Deborah Joe Rupp was busy. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that '70s yeah. show. Wait, wait, was that '70s show still on at this point? I think that was off, right? It was off. Yeah, yeah. it ended in 2006. So yeah, because I feel like. That 70s show like ended just around the same time that Mad Men started. Yeah. People were like, you know, 70s are done. We're going back to the 60s. Yeah, let's let's start this over. Yeah, let's go, let's do this one more time, as they say in Spider-Verse. Right. Um, so Duck is back. He's trying to poach uh Peggy and Pete, but kind of as a package deal. <clears throat> we start the episode with uh, uh Abigail Spencer. The teacher, she's still she's still around, and uh, she she comes back in the show a little bit later. She calls up Don, and uh, I don't know, maybe she's been drinking a little bit of a little bit of wine. Ben, I know you have a whole thing about this. Uh, you, <laughs> you just tweeted about it, and um, yeah, I mean, I I will preface by saying I agree with every word that you tweeted. But what what did you say? Oh, I just said it was very funny how you see Don introduced sitting at the desk like a child, 
and uh, being rather disconnected uh, during this parent-teacher conference. And then immediately she calls him and it's just has a drink in her hand. Like she has a bra strap to the side and she's like, I'm so embarrassed calling Mr. Draper. <laughs> and then the very funny thing is when a woman opens up the dawn, he makes a face like, well, I'm going to sleep with her. And she <laughs> says like, well, my father died when I was eight. And you can see Don on the other hand, he like squints his eyes and you can see like, oh, he's thinking it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause he had the scene where, you know, uh, whenever he first uh, sees her, which is very surreal the maypole um, yeah mm-hmm. he touches it the grass focuses on her feet which is very very strange to you know confirm that your uh sexiest man alive is, is a foot guy um <laughs> in one of your third season episodes um well, i mean i will say don's dad didn't give him much in life but he did give him a hall pass to who he was eventually later in life to get into affairs with various women including his teacher well, that's, it's interesting that you see how Don acts like a child around some women. And it's because, you know, I always think about the 30 Rock episode, which is like the hot guy bubble. And when you watch that, you know, with uh, Mad Men in mind, it's so funny because when John Hamm guest stars in an episode of 30 Rock, it's like people are giving him free things or doing anything he wants or letting him win tennis games just because he's hot. And Tina Fey is trying to explain that and say, like, it's just because you're hot. And he's like, no. And he's like, he doesn't <laughs> understand people are being rude to Liz Lemon. Um, so when you watch Mad with, Mad with that in mind, he's acting like an absolute child when he meets these beautiful women and they're just throwing themselves at him. Um, so that is the interesting dynamic between, uh, this teacher and Don is that she is someone who deals, who deals with children every day. And here comes Don Draper, who is not exactly emotionally, um, uh, mature. And now she's dealing with him. Um, so that is a very interesting dynamic between them because um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say this, but the way she speaks to him even during the scene is like she's talking to a child. It's like she's trying to explain, you know, the world like Meg Revers and of course these things. It's it's as if she was speaking to, to a child who doesn't who is growing curious about the world. Is the way that I see it. Um, so that's a very interesting aspect of the character. Also, the uh, the actress I just learned from that thread is best friends with Meghan Markle. I yeah, they were on, on suits. Uh, suits together. Yes. So she was at the royal wedding. Uh, I I would guess. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know that she was in a documentary, Netflix documentary between them. Oh, okay. I just sort of wonder that, like, uh, there's probably a timeline where Meghan Markle had like a one episode, you know, walk on from Mad Men, um, hmm. because her career at the time was I, Suits was like 2011, I think. And before that, she played a waitress or something in the Robert Pattinson movie Remember Me, which people remember for different reasons besides Meghan Markle playing a waitress. Um, but it's, you know, I just, I just thought about that with, you know, obviously her best friend being the, uh, the guest star Donna Fair in this episode. Hey, what uh, could have been? Fair to be, yeah. I mean, Remember Me is also a time piece in a way, you know? Yes. Like, uh, one day we'll we'll get the the Mad Men O's uh, series, I guess, uh, four yeah. years from now or something. Right. Well, remember me is about a time we can never forget. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I should explain because the listeners can't see our video here, and uh, there was a moment when Will got very visibly distressed uh, when, of course, Ben brought up the hot guy bubble thing. Then that's obviously when Will realized, oh, that's what's been going on. I'm so hot. <laughs> that's mm. why all these like people are nice to me so we'll uh we'll give you a second to process that because i know that's, that's got to be a shock sure. um but you know it is interesting that like yeah like uh abigail spencer's character does there's a like kind of similar to tony soprano like uh don when he cheats uh on women he has a very particular type and usually in addition to them being like burnett and having like very like kind of uh physical attributes but he like yeah he kind of prefers a woman who is like kind of more emotionally mature even if, if she's not older than him directly, like someone who is like a little bit more uh, confident, kind of directive. And there is something yeah, about this relationship where it kind of fits into that, but also doesn't like Ben saying, like she is a little bit more open, a little bit more vulnerable, uh, you know, something it kind of, I don't know. I wonder if it does kind of remind him back to that kind of fling he had in California with, I can't forget. I can't remember that woman's name, but joy, uh, joy. joy where like, she was also like someone who is kind of like, you know, like emotionally available and like vulnerable and like open in a way that he usually can't find with women. She is very open though. She's open to the point that her father is sitting on the bed whenever he wakes up. (laughs) I I think what you're referring to, Will, is that I think this attraction to this new type, I think it's new to him. I think Joy and to an extent, Suzanne, the teacher, I think that they kind of represent a different kind of woman that he's like, it's almost like a primal attraction that he has to them. A lot of it is based on lust. 
but uh, I think it's supposed to be a departure. I think it is supposed to be this kind of like tingling excitement for him. I think that's why he has a like little like fling sort of fling with the flight attendant who at first he's kind of just like playing around with, but I think that it's like starting to dawn on him that like, maybe this is the kind of person that's going to uh, fill that hole in his heart. Because I think the women up until this point have definitely been uh, clear, you know, Freudian mother replacements. And I think now he's starting to try to, I think a lot of this has to do with Rachel. Honestly, I think ever since Rachel, I think he's been floundering um, because that, type of woman i think it i think it has done a real number on him and so it's like he's almost trying to experiment with another type of attraction if anything recapture what he had with betty because i think betty in a lot of ways was this kind of person to him when they were uh, a lot younger right so the one way to look at it who knows it is interesting how much he has to experiment and kind of try and discover himself uh and again with you know me saying he's not Mature that flight attendant, you know the way he sleeps with her. He says it's my birthday. Yeah, yeah, and he does get a little pouty. One of his most pathetic moments, honestly. Um, it's very. That was one of the trivia questions uh, at last Madman trivia. It was very funny when everyone read it out loud. Uh, but it's just he's not emotionally mature, and that is very clear by the women that he you know goes after. I said earlier that hey, we get all the main players. I forgot we barely get Bobby Draper. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he's only in this a little bit, but he does kind of hang over the episode because, you know, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, what's going on? I was, I was mimicking Bobby waving. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were waving because you wanted to say something, but perfect. Um, yeah, Bobby, you know, Bobby is in this episode a little bit, but he's definitely like a little bit of a, a ghost in this because, you know, there's that that line where the prison guard who ends up having a boy and Don has a boy is like, you throw the ball around. And uh, Don's like, not enough. And, you know, there's the one question where a lot of us are wondering, hey, Don, why do you like ignore your son uh, and pretend he doesn't exist? Uh, because this also echoes from when yeah, I think it's uh, Gene or William a few episodes ago. It's like, oh, you take you take Bobby to the games uh, all the time, you know. He said he responds, uh, and clearly there's like we see Don with Sally a bunch, but there just seems to be this distance between him and Bobby. They haven't had a real moment since uh, really season one when he like bombards Bobby about like I'll never lie to you during Hobo Code, and. I think like a lot of that you can read into like Don is so afraid of being his father uh, and scarring his son and, and just believes that he's doing what's best. Uh, I, I don't know though. I, I, I don't know if there's something even deeper going on here beyond they don't want too much Bobby because people know that it's a different actor <laughs> and they had issues in season two with this where they, uh, I think they literally had like scenes that were supposed to have Bobby that they had to write out of the show because of issues with, uh, the character like the actor being able to play the character and it has just sort of morphed into this almost by accident but yeah curious if either of you have a read on that i don't think this is a spoiler to say you know because she's obviously a very big actress now uh but kieran and shipka i think that they realized they had gold there and they said we gotta write more for yeah her. that's true they realized like what a great actress she is and so you see as the show goes on it's like we're gonna give more to sally uh because they know how good she is uh, and I always thought that was funny with uh, the Bobbies getting uh, a new actor. You could have a podcast with the Bobby actors, you know, yeah, Bobby and Bobby. Put in a room. <laughs> um, do a uh, multiverse No Way Home Bobby movie. I wrote down a note where like the where Bobby's like, I, hi, I'm your brother, Bobby. And I wrote down, are you sure? <laughs> For now. Um, <laughs> but that is interesting to see with any shows where they have a performer, even if it's a, a child who does not quite have the chemistry that the show needs and the show changes as a result you see that in you know uh, a lot of shows usually their their first few seasons they've got to find uh, i mean you know parks and rec the character of ben wasn't introduced you know because for a while i forget which season he came in uh, season they, two the end yeah. of season two mark brandanowitz played by paul schneider yeah uh, paul they schneider. wrote him out yeah and, you know, that was just uh, nothing against Paul Schneider, but you could tell, like, that wasn't there wasn't a mesh there. Yeah. And shows have to do that. They have to kind of go through this process of figuring out, like, does this character mesh? Does this actor mesh? Um, and then they, you know, usually find their stride by season three, four with, like, this full cast of people get introduced. That's one of the downsides, too, of streaming, right? Where when you have all these episodes just drop all at once, you TV shows kind of lose that, hey, maybe we should like pick something up and try something a little different as we go that they used to have, you know, a little bit of more improv- improvisational writing. And uh, now it's like, 
it's all just kind of out there and there there can be a little little bit of a you know a lack of a feedback loop i think it i mean netflix drops all their stuff at once except for you could tell with the last season of stranger things i definitely do not think that they had the running up the hill the the fun the, the finale version mm. i think they realized you know what a major hit that was that, yeah. that was broken into two parts how they released it and then they point. they changed the climax to have running up that hill have a remix of the stranger things theme and i thought like there's no way they did that beforehand they obviously saw the impact impact that had and said make that the finale song as well they did the same thing with uh you i think i think mm-hmm. you was a reaction to stranger things where we're like we need to break this up into two parts because we need something we need people to speculate and talk constantly about this stuff will smiling because will doesn't watch these shows he's above <laughs> oh, it all I, said, I guess you didn't hear me i said you said you and i said me <laughs> <laughs> after the, the you can see secession sundays and how obsessive that fan base is exactly yeah you, you, you think like why does anything release all at once nowadays when you see what happens whenever you have something, you know, come out each week. Because if you dropped all of the session at once, it would have been absolute chaos online. I there couldn't too much. Yeah. There's no uh, way it's, it's not built for that. Yeah. No, you, it, it's about having, you know, as I mentioned with having theories about Mad Men, I would have loved to watch it, you know, on the air weekly and say, well, here's what's going to happen next. Um, that would have been a very interesting uh, experience. I did, uh, not at the very beginning of the series, but yeah, I really came in around season four and that's just like, yeah, there was nothing like it. I mean, mm-hmm. it was such an event, you know, NPR would have like whole episodes, uh, you know, just talking about like one pitch, you know, from, from one episode. It was so fun. I will di- digress here, but this is something I kind of want to focus on with TV very quickly is you've yeah. lost something about people sharing, you know, the same kind of experience of people watch everything all at once. Or there's someone who's like, well, I wasn't, you know, there's suddenly spoilers online that night. And you're like, well, I've got work, you know, I've got to watch it tomorrow. And there's no, never again are we going to have like uh, the Wizard of Oz being on and everyone coming into work and everyone watched the Wizard of Oz last night. Because it's like a yearly thing. That kind of experience of sharing something is gone. And it's interesting to watch a show like Mad Men because you have those type of events that people, you know, We'll talk about this was on TV last night. We all watched this event. So it's strange. It's already a bygone time. There's more things in Mad Men that become a bygone time, which with uh, each passing year. Yeah, it makes me sad. Like show like the the bear, you know, they just dropped Mm -hmm. all the episodes. I don't get it. Like the bear should be week to week. (laughs) It's It's so strange to me. I was going to say, I mean, isn't that kind of both? Like, I think on FX, it airs weekly, but. They drop yeah, but you know most people don't have cable, right? I mm-hmm. mean, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I think the, with FX, they were releasing it, but I don't even know if they were done with the season. I'd have to look into that. But it is interesting um, what Ben's alluding to with, like, like the death of, like, a monoculture, where I feel like that was something with, um, like, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where that's, like, a big theme of it, but also became a kind of monoculture moment, at least on, like, in the film circuits, where I feel like that was, like, one of the last movies, especially, like, pre-pandemic that you know I, I, a lot of people saw people still talk about people like still meme and reference and all that stuff and yeah i mean it's just becoming increasingly rare with tv or film to have you're like, telling me that didn't happen with the flash i thought everyone was sharing <laughs> that no <laughs> yeah um but i i definitely agree with that um and it's interesting briefly talk about once upon a time in hollywood seeing the influence films of that that influenced Mad Men as well that's the biggest influence in that film, Model Shop, the Jacques Demy film. It's the movie that Don is watching, the, the cigarette meme in the theater. The uh, the last thing I wanted to bring up before we go to trivia was the Don and Peggy scene. So we already brought up that Peggy is getting headhunted by Duck at Gray. Uh, Gray is a real ad agency, by the way. Um, I have a per- like personal professional connections to it. Never worked there, um, but I know people who have used to. And... Uh, she has this moment with Don where she's kind of talking about like she, she wants to get a raise. She has this whole conversation with him about it. Don brushes her off because earlier in this episode, we have a lot of stuff between Don and Lane where Lane is penny pinching the agency and he and Lane have a very interesting relationship. It's definitely more calm and I think sympathetic than what he had with duck. Uh, not that duck and Lane have the same job title, but Lane obviously is kind of a foil to Don but I think in a way where the two men genuinely kind of like each other and they actually, when they are at odds and have conflict, they actually kind of try to work things out uh, reasonably. They don't just stew and act like children, really. And so when all of that comes to shove, Peggy kind of chooses this timing to come in and ask for a raise because Doc is trying to take her away from the agency and she wants to seize upon the moment. And when Don, Don brush, brushes her off about it, she 
kind of starts to like lean back into those American dream themes where she's like, I envy what you have. You have everything and so much of it. It's a really intense kind of dialogue between them. And then Don, you can see him kind of soften a bit. He's so emotional in this episode. Uh, He's even called emotional at one point. I just think that it's really uh, striking the way that, you know, Peggy leaves the office and is like, what if this is my time for this kind of episode, seeing that especially contrast with Betty, because the episode ends, of course, with her pausing before she goes over to the, the baby's room and really just kind of like this begrudging acceptance of where her life is. Uh, it's really powerful stuff, but uh, yeah, big Don Peggy moment. I really liked it. I assume you two liked it as well. Mm-hmm. I think it with, you know, from episode one, you know, the first season, you are ready to see Peggy grow into what she can fully be. And she is doing that more and more each season. And that scene was definitely a, uh, you can see, you know, from this, you know, she is continuing to kind of climb and she's continu- continuing the fights. Um, and that is uh, everyone hates Bobby Barrett's, but Bobby Barrett has like one of the best lines to Peggy where she's basically saying, you know, here's what you have to do. This industry is not going to hand anything to you. These are men. They are not going to want you to be where they are. Um, and that's really, it, it's interesting for a character that everyone so despises uh, as Bobby Barrett's to give Peggy the line um, that is really kind of the inspiration for her to understand I've got to be everything that I can be. And even though it doesn't go her way, there's still this feeling of she's going to keep fighting. Um, or, but you also do wonder what's going to happen with her and, you know, with Sterling Cooper. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something really fascinating that we kind of touched on with Don this episode where he is someone who has throughout his whole time on the show has been like trying to move away from his past, like try to make himself a a self-made man and, uh, you know, go away from like this kind of working class uh, upbringing. But in this episode in particular, he's using a lot of that to source the empathy that he's feeling for these other characters. Certainly that's the case when he's talking to um, the teacher, Abigail Spencer's character, uh, his ability to kind of relate to like losing a parent early on in life and the, the struggle that he has a child not having a real connection to his parents and then subsequently using that to connect to Sally and realizing that's what she really needs in this moment. That's what she got from Jean that she hasn't been able to get with her mom or her dad uh, throughout the last few years, especially with uh, Dawn being away in California. And then we have this moment here where uh, Dawn is the only one that knows about Peggy's kind of dark secret other than Pete, I guess now um, about, you know, like how, uh, he, she had to give away this child, you know, she had to pick a career over her personal life in that respect. And, uh, you know, she has, you know, like these kind of fleeting moments of, uh, um, regret and kind of, uh, you know, longing. And, um, you know, he's able to kind of sympathize in that, like he had, you know, he really had to struggle to kind of like make himself the man he is. Uh, but he also got opportunities that, um, someone like Peggy doesn't get quite as easily. And I mean, it's, yeah, it's really interesting but also just really sad to see at the same time all right let's get into trivia there's just plenty more here i have a lot more for trivia than i usually do uh I so have, i want to bring go ahead and i know this is kind of potentially spoilery so if neither of you want to answer it that's fine but right. are we going to get more simpson actors in the future episode <laughs> admin I wouldn't dare spoil you on that. I want you to be pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised. I will. This is a very vague spoiler, but there was a show that was mentioned earlier and you will get more actors from a show that was mentioned earlier. I will not say which show. I was hoping this would be like, uh, like Roland Emmerich's Godzilla where just random (laughs) actors keep just popping up and you're just like, Oh look, there's Hank Azaria. Oh, there's Yardling Smith. Oh, there's, you know, Dan Castellaneta. And so I was hoping that'd be the case with Mad Men, but uh, it sounds like I should prepare to be disappointed. You should prepare for something, all right. All right, now let's get into trivia. Uh, so the prison guard that Don meets, his name is Dennis Hobart, and Hobart is the same surname as the ad man at McCann, who tries to headhunt Don in season one, which is a very fitting kind of connection because Peggy is the one getting headhunted in this episode. So there's like a, even more sort of like a thematic ringing of like, what if this is my time? 
kind of indicating that Peggy is really like rising through the ranks, honestly, um, that she would be sort of in the position that Don is, at least to some extent, um, at this point in her career, so early in her career, right? Because she's only like 22, 23, whereas this was happening when Don was like 34, 35. Uh, so interesting to bring that up. Uh, next, uh, I already kind of mentioned this. This episode takes place in June 1963. It takes place between June 20th and June 22nd. Um, I also already brought up this is the first episode in season three and a while of season two, not written by Matthew Weiner or co-written. Um, Betty's doctor um, is Dr. Mendelowitz, who was actually a real-life obstetrician in that area uh, yeah. at that time. So, uh, yeah, nice little little connection there. And, uh, yeah, that's from Mad Men Carousel. So that include that. Um, and then we, we touched on this a little bit, but here are more specific details. So in this episode, Betty is given a cocktail of morphine and scopolamine to help with the labor pain. And she's told that she's going to be going into a twilight dream. This is a real thing that happened during the 1900s, the 1970s, known as the twilight sleep. Many women were encouraged to use it in hopes of having a drama-free birth. Even Queen Elizabeth II used it while giving birth to her third child. Uh, the writer and author Pip Lincoln wrote about the approach, saying it unfortunately caused more problems, including depressing a baby's nervous system and breathing problems. It also led to traumatized mothers because the hope was for women to just doze off and let the doctors do the delivery work. However, like Betty, many women often woke up intermittently during labor, thrashing about in distress before being lulled back in submission with more drugs. Twilight sleep fell out of favor once it was realized that women and babies were suffering and even dying from it. It was outlawed in the 1970s. Sad stuff. Um, oh, this is, a, this is a fun one. In 1969, Admiral, the television company, did advertise in the black magazine Ebony. So yeah, what, what Pete was kind of you know pushing for in this episode does eventually come to pass. And it, it is so interesting. I love like when Pete suddenly is like progressive liberal cuck Pete. It's so, <laughs> it's so fun to see. Cause he's just such a, he's such an enigma. He's our boy. Um, are you, are you a Pete fan, Ben? I find Pete fascinating, but that's the thing is there are plenty of his moments where you think it, you, it's interesting what kind of things uh, Pete would be fighting for in the 2020s is kind of what you think. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, the whole, the whole get out, uh, meme of, I would have voted for Obama a third time if I could have, and you kind of get that Pete Campbell vibe there. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, yeah, uh, it, it's hard to defend him when he does do other things that are quite terrible. Uh, so it, it's, I, <laughs> his character path like Peggy's is very interesting. I, again, will not get into spoilers with it, but, uh, I think that that enigma side to him where you see you're introduced to him wanting to loathe him in season one. And then you're given moments where you see kind of a pure individual, a guy who's very good at his job, someone who will fight for things he believes in. And you're like, well, who's this guy? And it's slowly they're at battle with each other. So that's a very interesting yeah. part of his character. He'll do the Charleston one episode at a party with blackface. And the next episode, he'll be like, you think I'm a bigot? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I could see to Ben's point. I could see, Pete being the type of guy in 2020 that that posts the like uh, all the black, black square, yeah, yeah, yeah. I solved racism. <laughs> um, on that note, Pete uh, talking to Hollis in the elevator mirrors when Don is talking to the bus boy in the pilot. So when he's asking, like, "Oh, why do you smoke Lucky Strike?" Now Don does it a little bit more, like, of an you know a less I think aggressive way. Uh, you, you don't really get the sense that he's just trying to like one man survey this bus boy. Uh, I mean, he kind of is, but he's kind of just trying to search for inspiration. Whereas like, yeah, when Pete is doing it, he's, he's very much of like, Oh, you all know each other. Like that kind of implication. Right. Uh, but then it, it's so interesting how it, that interaction ends with Pete and Hollis kind of joking about baseball and stuff. And so kind of coming to a little bit of like a, all right. Yeah. Cause, cause there is that moment where, Hollis just looks at him when he's just like the American dream, Hollis, don't you want the American dream? And he's like, this white boy is too dumb. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't even respond to that. Um, each journey is to not be Don, And he doesn't realize that there's going back to the episode with joy in California. It's, you know, she just walks up to Don and says, Hey, do you want to come to our place and have Mexican food? He's like, what's that? And then they go off and they have Mexican food. And, Pete's like, there's some girls that like drop some papers yeah, or something. Yeah. And he's like, how are you beautiful ladies doing? And they just walk away. And it's, <laughs> it is, the camera stays in his face. And he's just like, oh man, I'm not done. Yeah. His, his Riz level is definitely oh, uh, zero. Yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, this, this is interesting. So Don borrows slash steals Sal's line 
from the first episode of the season, uh, our worst fear is lion anticipation. Uh, so he said, he says that to uh, Dennis, you know, when Dennis is kind of freaking out about the baby and everything. Uh, but unlike Sal, Don does not credit Balzac because Sal is just like, Oh, that's not me. That's Balzac. When he says that in the London fog thing. And uh, Don kind of passes it off as his own. It's a little bit of like a, you know, because earlier in the episode, the guy's like, you're an honest guy, Don. Or no, later in the episode, that's when he says that. It's like, you're an honest guy. I'm an expert. Believe me. But, uh, you know, it just it adds to the facade that Don is a, a bit of a fraud. And that's always kind of hanging with him. Um, yeah. And then my last piece of trivia here. Uh, the classical score playing over Betty's dream sequence, uh, Sizz, uh, and the end of the moment, uh, the end of the episode, is Mi voy a morir de tanto. Uh, which is by Alberto Iglesias. It's from the soundtrack to a movie called Sex and Lucia. Uh, have either of you seen that movie? No. I have not. I was going to ask you about that. Have you seen it, Don? I've, or John? I've, I haven't seen it, but something tells me I've lived it. <laughs> Will's eyes widen. He's like, another classic John story that's probably made up. Um, no, but it's a wonderful score. I uh, I downloaded it today because I was like, you know what? Life's, life's short. I do know, um, at least in the Mad Men Carousel, they mentioned that that was another film that like gets progressively more surreal as it goes along. So I guess that's like kind of another nod uh, to the kind of increasingly surreal dreams that uh, Betty has throughout the episode. Now, is there uh, any last trivia that you had, Ben? Because you're the trivia expert, trivia king, I think, uh, is what uh, some say. Uh, I try to think about what I would build around this episode for. Uh, I, if I was to do trivia questions, it'd be like, "What is what is Betty crushing her hand?" You know, and it's just it's interesting, you know, because obviously it's it's a caterpillar. But you know, you'd get people's trivia sheets, and you'd be like, you know, looking at it, you're like Bobby. You know, uh, I like see, you know seeing people guess what they think she crushes, and you're like, "No, it's a caterpillar." You should do so a Family the, Feud style trivia one night. Just do I like should. Um, uh, we have that in uh, my hometown here, and uh, it's actually really fun for trivia nights. It's, it's funny that any trivia night you do, there's going to be, regardless if it's a new group or an old group, someone's going to name themselves Not Great Bob. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the trivia names are always uh, quite fun. Mad Men um, Men, hopefully, is going to come up at some point. Hopefully. Um, and, and hopefully, it's going to be all women who are in that group. <laughs> that was the only way it works. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ben Crew, for coming on the show, talking Absolutely. Mad Men with us. We've got, we got to have you back. Absolutely. We'd love to. And uh, of course, uh, is there anything you'd like to plug? I know you've got some fun trivia stuff. I feel like listeners of this show should be aware of what's going on there. Well, I think uh, the Chicago Madman trivia is going very well. Um, I really want to see it expand to other cities. Um, if you want to have it expand to your city, we're trying to work on people I know in NYC and LA having it there. Uh, so reach out to me, mostly through Twitter is the best way to do that. Um, New York and, and LA do seem like a natural fit. Consider, yeah, I, I think it's just like you know, like if I lived in either, either of those cities, I'd be working hard to set it up right now. But it's just like I, I don't know what the best bar that has the '60s vibes to go to is there. Uh, it's hard to you know kind of try and uh, pilot that you know from Chicago. But I, I, what I am happy to do is that Chicago is kind of sets you know the standard for what it should be like for how it goes. The big thing that happened recently, um, I guess one to have maybe a while away, but for season four is the suitcase. What we did the last trivia was we did a screening of the 1960s TV edit of the suitcase, which is basically, you know, season four is the suitcase, which is a wonderful episode. And it was edited to be in black and white. And in the commercial breaks, it now has 1964 real advertisement commercials play. Um, and that was first off watching an episode of Mad Men, with you know over 40 people hearing them you know laugh and even cry uh was just insane because you know i've only ever watched Mad Men with like a couple other people uh, so we gotta we gotta write that down for when we're in season four i feel like that's a must ben crew episode to absolutely. have you on um because i mean i wa- wa- watched that so many times from having to edit the you know black and white version uh and how this just imprinted in my mind yeah, Will, um, in case you know, a suitcase is considered by a lot of people the best Mad Men episode. It's mm-hmm. definitely one of the top uh, contenders, yeah. I mean, I'm just glad that Ben made an episode that allowed us to see how uh, Hollis would watch the episode on his black and white TV. Wow. <laughs> Drawing it in. Yeah. That is, that's, yeah, that's the American dream. Um, thank you again, everybody, for listening. We'll be back with more Mad Men, uh, Mad Men Men, I should say, as we continue to move through season three. See you all next time. Bye.